Hello there. It's a uh, privilege to uh, be among the uh, closing or wrap up sessions. Um, hopefully, uh, I can keep you all um, engaged for the, the last uh, 40 minutes. Um, as we as we get to the close, my name is Kate Wendecki, um, Fuji Xerox, Australia. Um, and today is my hope that I'm going to be doing something a little different. So I knew <coughs> in the sessions, I thought, well, um, you've heard a lot about products, you've heard a lot about this widget and that widget and this solution and that solution. I wanted to um, take it um, up a, a huge level and talk about innovation. Um, I got onto this subject because I looked at uh, Xerox Corporation, I looked at uh, Fuji Xerox, and I looked at our parent company, which is Fuji Film. So Fuji Xerox is an automation of Xerox Corporation and Fuji Film. And the Fuji Film tagline is actually uh, value through innovation. And on the Xerox website, um, you will see links to Park, you will see uh, links to Research and Webster, and the focus is all about innovation. And you go to the Fuji Xerox website, and again, much the same, it's technology, it's all about innovation. So I started um, on, a, on a journey sort of trying to figure out where does that, where does that innovation actually come from. So that's, that's really um, the theme for today. Um, when um, there was a possibility to come speak, I said to Enda, so the title of your conference is Innovation Day. Is, is that right? I said, I've, I've actually got a presentation on innovation, so maybe it would possibly fit in with the theme of the, uh, the conference. And uh, he said, sure, well, I'll look at it. And so I uh, had that, uh, that, that look at this before. But things I want to uh, uh, share in this presentation, getting to know each other. I'll get a few intro slides so we save time I let by uh, the intros. Um, two little words, two little words that have absolutely changed the world and continue to create trillion dollar industries. So thinking about what those two words are. Um, the ingredients for innovation in business. Uh, what, what, what makes innovation actually come together? How does it, how does it, what's the catalyst for it? And then <clears throat> some of the um, results of our, our, uh, our work here in, in Australia and around the world, uh, but more, more here in Australia um, with our, uh, our partner, XFI. Um, so I think we've done some really great things. And, and a history of innovation at Fuji Xerox as well, some of the takeaways. Um, and that one slide, there's, there's a little shot there, it's a little fuzzy, you really can't see it, but it's kind of um, looking at things differently. So it's actually an upside down shot, there's a reflection. And you know, you look at it first and you kind of think uh, the reflection is like uh, really super clear. It's like, well, it's upside down. So I just want to turn things on its head. A little bit about me, so I grew up in Los Angeles, only child. Um, everybody always asks, what's the K for? And um, I don't know, it's not actually, no, what is the key for? It's actually Ken. But growing up, there was my grandfather, my father, it was Ken, it was Ken, it was Ken. So it was like, got confusing, so they called me Dwayne. When I entered the workforce, Xerox, 1986, they said, you know, you know what your first name is. And I didn't want people to call me Ken, so I just put K there. It's okay, it's, now it's on my passport, my driver's license, everything's K. I was also a DJ, um, a few highlights. Um, so when I was a DJ, it was DJ, not K Dwayne, because that didn't really flow, so it was DJ KD. Um, so the kind of KD kind of kind of story. Yeah, you know, John just yeah, you know, John said I've got up here with the the uh, <laughs> empty chair table. Um, I'm a bit of a dreamer, and so that's probably the the session I think you'll see that I really think about I was sort of thinking about these things, thinking about innovation. Um, I was a hacker before it was cool. The records fortunately have not been expunged. Um, he, uh, I had a trip to New Zealand when I was 12, and that's probably why I came to Australia. Um, I started with uh, Xerox, as I mentioned, in um, 1986, and I started a call center. It was a call center for something quite innovative. Nobody knew when I told them what I did. I, I work in the laser printing hotline. They're like, laser printing hotline in 1986, what is that? You know, and I was 18. Um, and then my eyes were just wide open because I worked in this place where they had, they took out the fiber optic network in the 15-story tower that we worked in because it wasn't good enough <laughs> in 1986. And we had 
we had icons and desktops and things like that that nobody even knew about. And I was like just wide eyed with um, just dreams of what's possible. Um, a few other highlights that I mean, I also came to Australia, and for me, uh, 1998, I um, started with Foodie Xerox. Um, 2001 and 2005, I became a dad, um, my two beautiful children, Christopher and Ella. Um, and one of the questions I asked is I, I did a version of this presentation for MSP photography, they invited me to their annual conference, and I, it was more for fun photographers. I said, Here's some innovation I'd like to know. When the kids get to about maybe about 11 or 12, um, for some reason, it's no longer cool to smile with dad. Like, why, why is that? Can we invent something to sort of force a smile? Because there's literally at least 20 photos just to get a grimace on my, my son's face. Um, and then you can see in like um, the, the high school shots there, they go from like smiling, they'll feel like it's not cool anymore, I'm not smiling anymore when somebody tells me to. Um, so a bit about you, what I wanted to find out is, so who here um, is a first time attendee of the user conference at all? Hands? All right. Um, who's who's um, who's been to the U.S. Exoplanet user conference? Quite a few. Um, and how many how many uh, owner operators do we have in the audience or people of business? Okay, a few. Um, how many vendor suppliers? We got quite a quite a quite a number supporting you. Which you feel good about, good about that. Um, and the most important thing I think is how many people have a passion for what you do. You wake up in the morning and you just like burning passion, I love this. I think a lot of us in the print stuff industry, um, like print and marketing communications in general, I think that's why we stay in it, because we sort of love it. Um, and I suppose that led me on the search, is just because people love it, that's where the innovation comes from, and I think there is, there's a part of that. Um, but I think it's it's interesting you start diving down into it, where innovation actually comes from. So two words, two words that, as I said, um, two two little words that change the world and continue to create trillion dollar industries. Anybody? Disruption. Disruption. Okay. Well, dis uh, disruption. Disruption. Uh, okay. One word. But what if? What if? Okay. Cool stuff. What was it? Y'all not great, we're not great. Well, um, Dan got it, maybe seen the presentation for her to talk about it. Um, what if, like, there's a lot of words. So, Xerox Corporation's got a campaign that they've run a couple years ago. They said, why not? So they moved on from what if. But I still actually like what if. Because what if is, is like, I'm just kind of thinking about the possibilities. And I think that's the most important thing. So everything that you've been hearing and absorbing the last day, day and a half. Hopefully you walk away from this, you've written enough notes, you've talked to enough people, you've networked, and you're actually thinking, what if, what if I did this different thing, what if I created this product, what if I did something different in my business, what if I partnered with somebody, what if actually starts the process of a journey, potentially, and a journey to hopefully improve business and different things. Um, what if I did a little bit of a timeline, and I, I, I kind of said, all right, down the, um, millennium, like we've been having this what if, um, and from I, I kind of started like sundial. Okay, that's really pre. This is not to scale, <laughs> right? That's really pre pre history. You know, go, go way 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 back. But I think for us in this room, printing, you know, Gutenberg, well recognized. That's when information sharing kind of radically changed. It it, it completely changed because we could actually take information and propagate it. And this whole thread that I've weaved here mostly is about the transportation of knowledge and people. So you think about all the innovations of the last few hundred years. Um, I, I suppose you look at the light bulb and you go, okay, well, what's that, what's that about? Um, but if you think about it, it's hard to share information in the dark. You can't get information unless you have light, so you need light to actually um, propagate information, a camera, being able to transport a picture, capture a moment in time, being able to share it. Um, and right the way through, from television to radio, um, of course, with transportation, you go, well, 
what are you transporting? A lot of times it's raw material, but uh, you know, a lot of times it's people. You're transporting people from one place to another place to share information, gather information, um, be able to exchange ideas. Um, in this tree, Xerox kind of entered in this era of the early um, computers. So some of the first ubiquitous computing devices, handheld, um, some of the first icons, graphic user interface. You've heard the stories many times. Um, that's where Xerox kind of entered. And the whole idea was to share information, to be able to um, rapidly share information. And that led to um, quite a few what ifs. And so I just wanted to jump to some of those what ifs. A lot of you probably have seen a lot of this before. Um, the what ifs of Conier. Um, I mean, I still am in awe of Chester Carlson for 20 years going, what if? What if somebody in an office could put a, a document, because remember he was a patent uh, clerk, what if they put a blueprint or something, and press a button and get a replica of that? Because before it took weeks to get that done, and sending things out for film, and he spent 20 years of his life bringing that to market, and it really did change the world. Xerox became kind of the Google uh, of, of the, the 20th century. Um, so the first um, 914 and 9, 1959, Gary Starkweather, he said, what if, he's like, what if instead of reflecting light on this drum, this box, what if I could use a laser beam somehow? And what if I could put actually dots, I could charge the drum a different way instead of reflecting light, I could just put a laser beam there. And interesting, if you ever get into this, we hear in history, it was just a coincidence that just at the right time, he got just the right part from just the right collaboration to make that happen. Um, and then through um, the 1990s and 2000s with um, the DocuTech, which is kind of where I um, got my, uh, a lot of my proving ground, learning ground around print on demand, um, and the iGen in 2000. So the iGen came out, um, you know, Drupal first under glass, and then actually saw its uh, way into the commercial print space. Um, and it truly changed the world of print manufacturing. Um, being able to do a unit manufacturer of a print run to run of, of one of super high quality, being able to run a uh, offset. Um, continued, continuing on into the 2000s with photo book productions, big shutterfly high floor, big uh, um, MSP, with what they're doing with um, photographic products. We've continued to innovate this idea of being able to just manu manufacture things on demand. My background was print on demand, that's why I came to Australia. I was advocating this in 1998. Unfortunately, the internet quite hadn't come of age yet, so a lot of the things I was talking about were five and ten years ahead of time. But you know, now it's commonplace. We carry around our, our phones you know, in our pocket, and we have the ability to do things that um, are absolutely amazing. In the future, um, we've got continuous feed and other technologies that some of which I'm going to show you here are truly amazing. Apologies on the audio. Only way I can do this is to um, uh, is to move the microphone down. So we'll give this a go. Chester Carlson stood in his kitchen with a grease pencil. He wrote on the glass plate the numbers 10, 22, 38, and it was a climactic moment. The discovery is called Xerography. It has been made by Xerox. And take this imaging system, a physical kind of photography, and make it one of the great industries of the world. The Xerox 914 the company. Company. Successful single product of all time. The Xerox 4,845 copies of the, the world's first desktop computer. A laser magnetic hard copy that you can read. Since you wires the road that link to a Xerox computer, they can the Xerox. How about this is one of the members of the community? Xerox and you can star information all at the bottom. On my desktop, I have a document together by the local area. Well, this latest thing is the copy machine. Full document. Here I'm acquiring affiliated computer services that are together to the companies to create essentially a new term software. Here I'm going to go out and put the same thing to do a doctor's virtual monitor all in the future. We have these document services. Let us remember 75 years of Xerox breakthroughs and signify <coughs> how work gets done. And then, let's marvel at what could happen in the next 75. Um, I really like that because in 75 seconds it encapsulates the DNA of Xerox. So when I came to Xerox, a lot of those things in the video you, you saw 
were actually just there at my fingertips and I, I was blown away as an 18 year old. Um, the, the technology that I had at, at my disposal. Um, at one point I had four computers on my on my station because I graduated from being the data entry guy taking the calls on the laser pretty much one to being a guy solving the problems on the other end of the phone, which is actually pretty cool. Um, so that sets the scene for like there's a lot of innovation that we saw, graphic user interface, icons, computers, laser printing, fax, um, all this technology sort of I really got to thinking, where does it all come from? These just really smart people, it's just those park people that they hired to sit on bean bags in the 1970s and come up with all this stuff. And it's like, okay, so you can't like get this unless you get those kind of people and, and get them out in, uh, in an environment like that. Um, is it really because of just really great tech? They just stumbled upon something and they got really great tech and so all of a sudden something just happened. Um, or is it really high performing teams? Is it, is it something that you, know, that you can actually do to just, just make this happen? And I, I think, um, I, it's like down the rabbit hole. I keep asking that question. I keep asking that question. I keep finding different dimensions of it to answer the question. Like that's why there's, there's actually not a single view of it. But Sir Ken Robinson was hired by, by Xerox Corporation in, uh, in Europe to speak. He's an expert on education and behavioral science. And he actually, um, his frame is, is that imagination is the source of human achievement. And, Hence, when I said what if, like what if is one of those things where you are using your imagination when you're saying that. Um, so I wanted to play a video, it's about five minutes, um, but I can't, I couldn't begin to tell the story like uh, Sir Ken, so I thought um, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd bring, him, bring him to the session here for you. <laughs> the, the greatest power we have to human beings is also the source of many of our greatest challenges, the power of imagination. See, we're here to say a few words about the culture of innovation, but and companies are interested in innovation, and they should be. But we can't get right to it. There are really, to me, there are three big themes in innovation. There's what concepts, imagination, creativity, and innovation. Imagination is where this comes from, and I think it's what sets the apart from the rest of life on Earth. And by the way, very little does. But this does, it's the power to bring into mind things that aren't present to our senses. But from that comes everything. From it comes all the practical powers of creativity. Creativity is a step on from imagination. You know, you can be imagining all day long and never do anything. And some people are. To be creative, you have to do something. Creativity is a practical process of putting your imagination to work. You can think of it as applying imagination. Using your imagination to tackle a problem, to conceive of an alternative, uh, to solve a conventional problem or invent a whole new way of the things that you haven't thought of. There's a more specific definition, which is creativity is the process of having original ideas that have value. And we can understand a lot about how that process works. Everyone has the imagination, not everybody feels they're creative, and there's a reason for that which I'll finish on in a minute. And the third one is innovation, which is putting good ideas into practice. My argument is that the powers of innovation, creative imagination, are now central to all of our flourishing. You see, most companies have a good idea occasionally. We all know most companies are based on somebody's good idea. But the companies that succeed get beyond the 10, 20, 30 year mark the ones who keep up a flow of ideas. That's what a culture of innovation is, where it's systematic, where it's routine, where you kind of do this thing to order. I was looking recently, I mentioned that the iPad. I don't know if any of you, I'm sure many of you have some dealings with Kodak. Uh, Kodak is a very interesting case to me. I mean, Kodak as you know, uh, has been going through difficult um, bankruptcy proceedings over the past few years. When I was growing up, Kodak was synonymous with photography, home photography. Kodak invented the brand new camera, uh, which was the iPad of its day. It was, it was as sensational in 1900 as the iPad was when it came out here. It was a completely new way of people thinking about their lives and how they could record it. A complete sensation. For a couple of dollars, they could buy this technological marvel. Of course, it's now a museum piece, as the iPad will be, by the way, in about 20 years' time. There's no question that your grandchildren will be looking at pictures of you with your iPad, with patronizing smiles, you know, saying, oh, look at you, you know, with your iPad. <laughs> what was it like? Did you have to carry it? It was a thing you had to carry. <laughs> Kodak has gone into bankruptcy proceedings not because people stopped taking photographs. In fact, people are taking more photographs than ever, aren't they? Irritatingly, more photographs 
Zen effort. Like, here's my cappuccino. Fantastic. <laughs> it's the same cappuccino moments later, when I've taken a sip from it. Vital social documents. They went out of business because they didn't adapt. They didn't keep up. They put all that money on film because it was a company founded by chemists based in chemistry, and chemistry is what they learned and what they did. They had to do about digital photography, but they didn't bet on it. And the consequences of people who did have moved forward, and the company itself has failed to adapt in the way that other companies have. So innovation is in some frippery. Uh, adapt, adaption is at the center of how organizations grow and flourish and outlive the ones that don't. So, if you're interested in cultural innovation, there are really um, three myths to contest with. The first thing is this, that creativity is at the heart of, of innovation. Very many people think they're not creative, that's my experience. By the time people get to the adults, they think they're not creative. And my argument is that everybody has profound creative powers, but you have to develop them. It's like literacy. Every child learns to speak, but they don't all learn to read and write. And it's because it's a set of specific cultural skills you have to acquire that you do have to be taught. Some things you don't, some things you do. And having the capacity for creative thinking is the same as having the ability. And ability is an evolved capacity, but it's a step on. So if you want that cultural innovation, you have to give people the skills, the tools, the process to actually do what's required of them. A real cultural innovation involves everybody, not just a few. The second myth is that Creativity is about special things, so it's the art department's work or the marketing department. I know fantastic creative organisations which create in all sorts of unexpected areas, systems and processes. You know, and, and Apple has been very good at products. Walmart, which has also been immensely successful in all kinds of ways, has not invented any products. Their innovations have been in systems and in supply chain management. Um, Starbucks didn't invent coffee. They invented a kind of culture to go with coffee. Actually, they didn't invent the $7 coffee, I thought. Which is better than I thought. So it's a three step process. Firstly, if you're serious about innovation and creativity, we have to recognize it's about people. Secondly, it's about great groups. And third, it's about the ambient culture. But I just want to say a couple of words about this before we wrap this up. Can I ask you one? So if I, I've cut it right there. He's, he's quite entertaining. There's a 30 minute version of that if you want to go on to YouTube. Just uh, <laughs> search uh, Sir Ken Robinson. I really enjoy his talk. Because he's coming at it from an, at, from an education standpoint, from a behavioral science point of view, he's actually looking at how do you embed this in, a, in an organization. And I think everything he said is right. Um, it's just the more that I went down the rabbit hole and I realized he's got it all, but he's looking at it. Uh, facet of it, and there's even more to it. There's, the more you look, the more there is to it. Um, so, some behavioral factors. And I always love quotes because um, they're quite poignant. They, they survive the test of time a lot of times because they are so, uh, so they're still truth. Um, this one was attributed to Henry, Henry Hartman, uh, but I think it actually goes back to a Roman scholar. I forget the Roman scholar's name, but I mean, that just shows you how a lot of these times, these nuggets of truth um, survive. Um, so success always comes from preparation and opportunity. I, I really believe that. I added to that though my own little tagline, the plus plus down there is supported by passion, desire, determination, motivation. So some of these other quotes are a lot about that. Mia Hamm, she's an Olympic athlete, um, and she's the backbone of success is hard work, determination, good planning, perseverance. And you hear that as a common theme as well, that people actually get someplace, that innovation actually comes about through blood, sweat, and tears, and right? you hear that often. Um, is not only to not be fearless, have a vision, believe in yourself, always hustle, stay focused, get out there, get motivated, get inspired. Like, if I, if I said that this is the characteristic of a leader that was in an innovative company, you wouldn't be surprised, would you? You'd go, yeah, okay, that's probably um, true. Steve Jobs, the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world do, um, because they actually just have this burning passion, they see the world differently, why can't it be like that? Um, and they, they'll do anything to sort of get there. Um, Napoleon Hill uh, desires the starting point of all achievement. So he actually says the desire is really the important thing. You've got to have this catalyst um, to get the achievement, not a hope, not a wish, but a keen pulse of desire, which transcends everything in your being. It transcends everything. Um, then I get more practical and look at like Mark Twain. And I, I like this one because um, you would never thought you'd play off Mark Twain from Tony Robbins, well, maybe you would. 
Um, continuous improvement is better than delayed perfection. I love that actually because it's kind of saying, you know, as long as you've got a particular direction and you're always taking steps to get there, you're actually um, better off. And that's what Tony Robbins says, no matter how many mistakes you make, how slow your progress is, um, you're still way ahead of everybody who's not even um, trying, they're not even in the race. Um, and I, I think that's really important for innovation too, is that iterative, you're not afraid to try, to test, to fail, to learn, to grow, to fail, to learn. You know, you're always actually trying to uh, move forward. Um, Peter Drucker, Drivers of Next, uh, Innovation, he actually says that innovation comes from the unexpected, um, incongruity, process mean that just drives this innovation, that, that the industry or the market structure itself changes somehow that forces the innovation to come, to come about. Um, sometimes by demographics, a shift in demographics sometimes drives innovation. If you think about um, Detroit, how they sort of changed their whole city around this whole idea of what they were to what they became um, and only, only several years ago. Um, the mood or the meaning or some new knowledge enters the world and all of a sudden that creates its catalyst for innovation. Um, there's a really great book um, on the innovators. It's called The Innovators by uh, Walter Isaacson. And um, he, he actually talks about how all those other things that I just that we just covered are really important, but it's the collaboration. So when he's talking about the, the innovators, it's actually a, di a digital era, and it's how computers and, and sort of the modern computing era kind of came about. Um, things that we take for granted now, like an RFC request for comment, and these uh, ISO we mentioned earlier, so these ideas of having standards and and uh, applying them in the computer world, protocols and different things, the internet itself, um, came through a lot of collaboration. So, you know, what if we collaborate to get further, to get farther, to get faster? And that's why we're sort of all here as well, isn't it? We're networking and we're collaborating to get ideas so we can actually drive our business further. So I looked at um, um, trying to summarize so what are some of the common characteristics of innovative organizations? What can you do? What can you, what can you try to bring to your organization to kind of add um, to add to it, to have to help foster innovation. This comes from uh, comes from a Harvard Business Review study where I kind of took it and I'll turn it on its head and said these are characteristics of leaders. Then what what do they embed in the organization to make that happen? And so some of some of these they they have excellent the organization will have an excellent vision and purpose. They'll know exactly where they're going. But I think that whole story of uh, of Apple, you know, when Jobs came back, and he like knew there's certain things he wanted to accomplish, and he, he was going to get there no matter what, um, and, and and it permeates the organization. They have a strong customer focus, so organizations that are very innovative, they know exactly what they get in their customer's head, or what the customer's thinking, what they want, what they need. They're always thinking about it from the customer's perspective, um, and the value that they're creating for the customer. Um, they they. The environment in an innovative organization will have a, it'll be very trusting, a reciprocal trust. The manager, um, the leadership trusts the employees, the employees trust the leadership, vice versa, so that they're always, they know, I can test, I can fail, I can feel free to try something that may not work, I'm going to take a risk. Um, and that's actually encouraged. Um, employees uh, display, because of that, fearless loyalty for the organization that they work for. They, they will defend the organization, the mission um, that they're all doing. Um, and the, the culture um, has this idea of magnifying communication upward. An employee can feel comfortable enough to walk into the, uh, the, the CEO's office and say, I think we're doing it wrong, you know, and, and not, not fear any, um, anything from them. Um, the organizational set it's, it's stretch goals, and there's a sense of urgency in the organization. Speed versus quality. Uh, sometimes it's okay to put out a prototype, get an alpha test, and actually get feedback from customers because you might deliver a better result in the end. Your quality overall might be better because you've got something out that's feedback first. Um, leadership's candid in their communication. Almost, you think of the Jobs example, it was almost to the point where he was blunt. He was almost rude. Uh, we would say order by group, but he was really blunt. Now, the flip side of that is employees never were, were wondering where they stood, they always knew exactly where they stood with them. They knew, wow, actually, this, no, this is where we need to head, and, um, and that's where I stand. And the organization leadership, um, they inspire 
I guess bigger than the organization, it's a purpose. It's the idea, I think in the beginning, that purpose, that the purpose here, the Simon Sinek why, why we're doing this is, is apparent in the organization. Everybody knows why we're doing it. It's bigger, it's a bigger purpose, it's a bigger mission overall. Um, I then start thinking, okay, what is it about the technology? And I often use the example of a mobile phone. Um, Don's got my, uh, my mobile for some pictures, but as I, as I hold up that mobile phone, um, and if you hold up any other tech, you know, in comparison, I wanted to come up with like a, a formula for it. How do you know you're onto something? I, I'm, I'm still working on this. It's, a, it's an alpha, I'm putting it out there, um, but I call it U3P3. So um, the, the first thing is ubiquity is, is like, Whatever that device is, a mobile phone um, or a, uh, a cable connector, is the big thing is it's seamlessly able to be used. Can anybody just pick it up and just use it naturally? Um, this idea of ubiquity. Um, utility and usefulness, that transcendent of, yes, there is a utility for this. It really is useful. Uh, it's useful enough that I'll care whether I have it or not. Um, universality, the, the, the idea that the access um, and the understanding about this are not restricted. Um, Edison and Tesla, you know, there's an example. Um, Tesla had the better, um, uh, Nikola Tesla had the better, te the better technology. Um, Edison had got it out there. Um, it was, uh, it was, it was about access. So we, we all might be using Nikola Tesla's um, innovations. Um, problem and purpose. So is there a true value in solving the problem? Um, and then um, promotion. The idea is, is the, is the thing itself so pervasively um, uh, popular, it'll share almost share itself. I remember the first time I saw an iPhone. I went to the U.S. They hadn't come here on shore, and I actually saw one. And somebody put it on the table and said, "I can just push this icon. And I can just do this." And I was like, "Wow, I, that's pretty cool. I think that'll catch on." And you could see it, and the price scale. So, importantly, if um, if this is at a price scale that I can easily afford it, um, great. If it's a million dollars. Can't touch it, um, then you start to go. Well, it's, it's out of the realm. Um, I think it's all of these, and I think there is also a little bit of magic too that comes into it. The right time, it's the right place, it's timing, it's the right people. Um, this is a video from. Habits uh, of this kind of philosophy that Max implements, which is the best way to predict the future, is to invent it. Part was created by Sarah back in 1970 with a very specific focus, and that was to create the office of the future. Innovation, if you think about it, always is bringing together two things that people thought were mutually compatible and solving them together. And the invention is not using it itself in one start with one big idea. Usually it's a team of people, sometimes it's a dance. I like to call it the dance between what is possible and what is needed. Xerox has got a very long tradition of doing forward thinking research and trying to innovate around the future of work across different domains. Innovations at Xerox include things like these recruiters, the internet, the graphic news from interfaces, digital health phones, safe government, and music and movies. At Xerox, I think one of the things we pride ourselves on is interdisciplinary research. We bring together people with many different backgrounds to solve the problems. It's really great that you know, social scientists can work with machine learning experts and graphic designers and you know, produce really interesting and innovative projects together. We can switch rapidly between uh, different technologies, between different approaches, and between you know, different uh, business models. Sometimes all those people coming together, same way, asking the questions differently, can create something that's never done before. And we solve the same problem in the way. That exploration takes place when you work with people from different disciplines, when you work with customers, when you do field work. Actually, Xerox is a very exciting place to work. When something's going on down the hallway, there's a kind of a buzz, and people kind of waking up. Something's being invented here. What is it? Maybe I have an idea for it. And you just catch that energy all the time. The business of breakthroughs is a phrase that we point to, to describe our open innovation business. The idea is that we do breakthrough technologies, but with an aim at driving breakthrough business results. There's so much more innovation going on these days than there used to be. Innovation has to be, you know, front and center as a focus for a company today in order to compete. Zero Arts Innovation is a terrific partner for people because we not only quote unquote invent the future, we can invent the future and we make sure that it still fits. Because the future keeps changing, and it keeps changing what people's needs are. We love both imagining them and creating them. Imagine.
on the way in the future. So I had the, uh, I had the privilege um, to actually um, work for a manager that uh, managed the, uh, the it's called Roadrunner, it's code name, uh, DocuPrint uh, lab in the park. And so I actually got to go and go with him and uh, uh, see some of the uni students coming in doing browser um, testing um, with hyperbolic browsers and all kinds of really cool things. Um, and I really can say that that's, what's in that video is just a small snapshot of all the stuff that they're doing, which is just mind, mind blowing. Um, always is. Um, I wanted to um, just give a quick example. This is a Fujifilm example, Fujifilm, Fuji Xerox example. Example of what happens when technology changes really, really rapidly. So, and this is probably uh, relevant. I've got another quote here. The reason we can only survive and change faster in this environment from British. Um, and, you know, we, we obviously are probably print. We care about print. We're, we're um, uh, uh, those that when somebody says, oh, you know, print's going to die, you know, we would absolutely stand up. Well, that's not true. Um, and we, we know, we've all heard of 10 years ago, there's going to be no print, there's going to be no newspapers, no magazines. Well, you just heard, you know, a few examples of our magazines are being read more than ever. But um, you look at print and what does that mean? What if there is no print? I don't know, what if the resource of trees suddenly became really, really scarce and, you know, we had alternatives. Um, so, at Fuji Xerox, one of the focuses um, a, lot, a few years ago was, was looking at device dependent solutions. That's Horizon 1. What happens when the device is optional? Um, and then what happens when you don't need the device at all? So, think of that, that time period where you've got like minority report where you're actually having a user interface in space or on a wall or something, something just pops up in front of you. You don't need a device. Um, now a few examples, these are not minority report examples quite yet, but a few examples were um, you know, using wearable eye trackers. So, yeah, and this is now prevalent. We're looking at this, we're using wearable eye trackers to figure out where do people look on websites. What, when, when they first see the website, what are, what are the things that are going to catch their attention? Um, being able to look at uh, remote eye trackers and, and um, use that for other mobile purposes. Um, so you think of, there's obviously military applications, many applications where the you know, computer interface knows where you're looking, and so that gives you the information you need for that particular point. Um, also, information access tools. So, you probably may not have known this, but um, Fujifilm, uh, Fuji Xerox patented uh, embedded media markers. So, the idea that you could print something and then hold your your uh, your phone over it and actually have a full motion augmented reality thing kind of come up and be completely interactive uh, based off of uh, embedded marks in the, in the print. Um, and the other thing for active reading. So. Um, being able to highlight certain things um, and annotate or make document edits based on where I'm looking. So thinking about rapid document um, manipulation. So those are just a few thought-provoking ideas. Like why do we keep why do we keep thinking that? Well, um, like for me, the, the 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 idea that I could have something in my pocket, you know, my, my iPhone, and it could be a camera, it could be a, a, a research device, it could be something to do out there in reality. I mean, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, if you told me I was going to have that, I'd say, no way, I wouldn't wait till I get that. And, that, and it has changed the world. Thinking about the way we purchase things, the way we um, browse things. Um, uh, John was actually just telling me you know, his last experience here coming to, uh, to uh, uh, Cannes and Palm Cove, you know, not having Google to be able to look things up and how we just take it for granted, just getting information at our fingertips. Um, a little bit about some innovations that we've done um, here in Australia with our partnership with uh, XMPI, Fuji Xerox, and our, most importantly, the customers. Um, I'm very thankful for that. The last 20 years for me has been uh, a blast because it's, it's I've, I've actually, this presentation is really kind of reflective of that, is I'm looking back at all these projects I've been privileged to work on with my customers and think about what are all the things that we've changed in the market um, from the MSP example of school photography to um, Dan Reese telling me um, about uh, retail manufacturing and point of sale and videos that come up at point of sale because of XMPI triggering stuff. Um, we, we became a, a sales partner, sales channel for, for XMPI directly in 2004. And um, we really like to think that a lot of the success that we've had in this country with the highest per capita server installation in the world, I keep saying that. Um, you're on, I think I'm still right. Uh, I like that, I think I'm still right. Um, you know, that, that is a testament to all the hard work that, uh, that we put in, you know, 
that many years ago and keep continuing to put in. I've said tens of millions of print jobs printed with XMPI here on shore in Australia. I would actually venture that that's really conservative. I probably would be hundreds of millions by, by now, thinking back from that time. Um, it would be interesting to try and extrapolate, you know, what, what it actually is. I don't know if there's any way of doing it. It would be an interesting stat um, out of it. Um, from a DIY app platform that we did for AppCorp to, um, is Robbie still in the room? Robbie, there you are. Um, Robbie, you know, we, we, as an example, um, do we have urgency with IAG? <laughs> yes. We had, uh, the celebration party was uh, 40 people came. There were about five from Fuji Xerox. We had UX front-end designers. We had uh, agency um, uh, graphic um, creative uh, design. We had 40 people. IS infrastructure, Ravi and I were among the people there at the celebration party. Because we literally had three, mo three months to launch this system and um, a couple months in prototyping, building, and stuff like that. It was a, it was a few months from go to go. Um, it was amazing. Um, personalized key kiosks, the ability to walk up, and Robbie worked on this one with me a little bit too, with XFPod being able to trigger um, at a kiosk and have a unit manufacturing come out to a run of one off of a kiosk interface that you'd see in like a Harvey Norman or a Big W. Um, Identity Direct, the children's book publishing. Harley Davidson, the platform, again, I probably uh, not to Robbie because he knows about this one as well. All the, all the life cycle marketing that we did um, with, uh, with Harley Davidson. And, um, and most recently, um, the Australian government um, has uh, uh, adopted XMPI for identity documents, passport type graded documents. So for me, that was a real milestone, actually getting XMPI into the government, like where it's actually being used for highly secure um, documents. Um, I'll really jump through these very, very, very quickly, and this is why we're all here. Um, Circle, some of the early implementations of it, we actually um, uh, kind of pioneered um, here in Australia. Some of the videos that uh, you, we talked about, some of the best ones um, that we've ever ever put out there. Um, again, pioneered here in Australia. Um, Steve, Steve Couch, Steve Stone, I mean, some of the work that he did, um, still among some of the best. I think the, um, the, the example, this holiday example, um, still, I use this every single time I'm talking to customers about multi-channel and getting them thinking beyond just email, beyond just print, um, being able to tell that whole story from end to end. Um, I did want to um, also mention like what we're doing here in Asia Pacific from a hardware point of view, um, and I've got some samples up here that afterwards um, I'd like to share. And I'll probably skip through the stats. I mean, you've seen the stats about global trends. We've been talking about the whole conference so far about web to print, web to film, digital packaging. These are all the things that are on the rise. Um, and, and digital color continues to grow. But as Ida mentioned, uh, beyond CMYK, um, there really is a, uh, a demand for being able to produce things that are just that little bit different. And Fuji Xerox does have, I mean, we have the, um, leading range from um, from just something simple in an agency, in a small franchise, all the way up to um, continuous feed and everything in between. But there are two standouts in the portfolio. And I've got these samples here, which can't, I can't, I can't uh, let these out, but you can come up and have a look at them. For me, this is absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, going to change the market. Um, there's already hundreds of these out in the field. The print quality of this, it's called Jet Press, is phenomenal. So it's Fujifilm technology. Um, inkjet, we think inkjet traditionally, we kind of shy, shy away from it because we think about um, bleeding and ink and all the things that traditionally can't use the right stocks. And this kind of game changes that. Um, it actually puts the stock before it actually puts the on the page. Um, game changing. The other technology that we've obviously um, just released that, again, I think is, um, is game changing is uh, the Iridesk. Um, you may have seen the um, appropriate article from a cover actually recently um, that was actually printed on the Iridesk um, the, um, from Digital Press. I've actually got a sample of one of his jobs with um, an embellishment of silver, and you can kind of see it glistening probably in the light. For me, looking at 
30 years of electronic printing, I, I, never, I never dreamed you could do that on a zero graphic engine. The ability to have six colors, white, silver, clear, gold, gold, and be able to produce embellishments like this, for me, is game changing. When you add the XM Pi element to it, and I think I can do these to a unit manufacturer, to a run of one if I want to, off of a press, and have somebody order that on demand, that is amazing. And I can charge that premium for it, maybe hooked up to uh, um, you know, a run, a batch run, where I'm getting these just ordered and coming in, and being able to charge that little bit extra premium profit for that. Um, that is exceptional. Um, I think we're, we're in a very exciting time right now um, in, in print, where no longer will it be about um, quality. People will no longer question, is this quality good as offset? When you see these jet press samples, you will go, my goodness, they are better than offset. The, the, the quality is no longer going to be the issue. It's going to be all of the manufacturing process to do it. And this room here is positioned better than anyone to be demand manufacturers. It won't be about printing, it'll be demand manufacturing. Um, and it is just a question of what do you manufacture? Um, and that's where the imagination comes in and the innovation comes in. And I invite you all to hopefully go back to your business and think about how, what am I going to innovate next? Now, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ryan. Interesting stuff.